So welcome everyone, and we will get started. So uh, we're going to start off, and this is, event is being sponsored by Wanderground, which is an organization that I am working on creating an archive library located here in Rhode Island and probably hopefully will be of interest and service to lesbians in the New England region. Um, so this is an ongoing project that I'm working on. And over the past year, I was fortunate to receive a mini grant from the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities, which allowed me to ask the ever important question, is there any interest for any of this kind of lesbian archive work in Rhode Island? And I would say overall, the responses have been generally quite positive. As part of the grant, I agreed to do some public facing events um, to wrap up the year of my research. And many of you might have noticed that over the past couple of months, I've been doing a weekly blog with bits of summaries of the uh, information that I have found. So you can always go to wanderground.org and look at news and you'll see those blog posts there if you're interested in getting more detail about what's been happening over the past year. One of the things I was really interested in finding out was who are the lesbian authors in Rhode Island? Because I was not, I didn't move here until 2003. So everybody I know about is from the 70s to 2000. And I was not familiar with what activities and publications and newsletters and anything that was happening here in Rhode Island because I didn't live here during that heyday. And so one of the questions I was trying to find out was who's writing stuff in Rhode Island. And so I did find out a lot of publications and stuff and that actually, and that information is actually also on the website on, on an event that I presented earlier in March. But I also was able to find lesbian authors, some of whom I've already known, some of whom I heard from somebody who heard from somebody who told me about somebody. And so that's where I found many of the authors that you will be hearing from today. And I'm very excited. All of them have written their books since the year 2000, so after I moved here, which is pretty exciting and interesting to know that lesbians are still writing lesbian stuff. We know they are, but you know, sometimes it's hard to find. So I would first like to introduce Mary San Giovanni, uh, who has lived in Rhode Island for quite some time. Her first book was published by Bywater Books. I believe all her books are from Bywater Books, which is a lesbian publisher located in... Ohio, I think, yes. Um, close enough. Close enough. Okay. <laughs> Ann Arbor, Michigan. Oh, well, that's not close enough, but okay. Ann Arbor, Michigan. I should know these things, right? Her first book was Greetings from Jamaica, Wish You Were Queer. And that followed was followed by Camp Town Ladies. And her third book is coming out this summer. It's called 80% Done with Straight Girls. Uh, she's also written some screenplays. She's received several nominations for awards, uh, and she's on Facebook. You can Instagram her at Artwork for Mary, and she likes to paint and draw and stay creative, and she's a busy, busy gal. So welcome, Mary. Um, appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Meb. Thanks for all the work you've done, by the way. Just really appreciate you putting this together. So the first, uh, the book that I'm going to read actually is from the second book, because I thought with the third one coming out, um, it might be good since this is a trilogy to not start with the older book. Ooh, it's very glary, sorry. All right, there it is. Um, I'm actually going to read from Camp Town Ladies and from the first chapter. So the first chapter is the long haul wasn't designed for a U-Haul. My sister's voice always went through my head every time I saw a fortune cookie. And I heard it now as I ate a stale one from the takeout scraps in my cupboard. See, a vagina. My sister Lisa saw vaginas everywhere she went. If she had been in my kitchen, she would have broken the fortune cookie in half, turned the triangle shaped cookie wide side up, shoved it in my face and said, see, a vagina. I knew this too. No matter the mood I was in, she could crack me up. Other vagina sightings ranged from the obvious flowers to a more obscure list that included puffed rice cereal, pre-sliced hot dog buns, the Toyota logo, a Dorito, tacos, and several varieties of shellfish. When we were kids, she would trap a long, wide blade of grass vertically between her thumbs so she could blow into it to make a whistle. And then at some point, she would shove her spitty fingers into my face and say, see, a vagina. 
Lisa always spotted vaginas before I did. And this, she would say, was my biggest problem. Sure, I could see the resemblance in a fortune cookie, but I maintained that the blade of grass between two thumbs whistle was stretching it just a wee bit. With my sister around, there was simply no way to hide a vagina, except maybe with her favorite pair of extra large camouflage boxer shorts. While Lisa chose camouflage as a fashion statement, there was never anything camouflaged about her preference for the fairer sex. My sister barreled out of the closet, knocking me down with the closet door she had ripped off its hinges, proclaiming herself a lesbian, just as I was starting to wonder about my own preferences. I was the gay tortoise, she was the queer rabbit. While I was secretly reading books in the library on a fact-finding quest after hopelessly falling in love with my straight best friend, Lisa, my sister, left me in the dust, blazing by me in a friggin' rainbow-colored Macy's Day Thanksgiving float with a turbocharged engine. The fortune cookie wasn't the only reason I was thinking of my sister. Lisa had threatened to call me any minute now, so what I really needed was Cheetos, and not the fake cheddar puffs mom brought when we were kids, but the real deal. I tried to ignore the craving as I settled back on the couch, remembering how mom would hide the ger generic stop and shop bag deep in the trash and pour the inferior puffs into a white ceramic bowl, thinking us kids wouldn't know the difference. See, mom would say, same orange stuff on your fingers. Then she would offer up the neon evidence as if they were the real thing. But Lisa and I noticed how the fake ones sat uncomfortably in the bowl, much less of a dramatic curl looking packed flat like cheap Chinese food. And we noted the orange number five was off just a shade. Maybe it was orange number six. And that the color didn't cling to your fingers in that same fluffy fiber way, but more like thick war paint. I wished I could spot a faux lesbo just as easy. And I thought of Lauren Elaine for the millionth time, the actress, the ex. I knew she was never the real deal or that she wouldn't let herself be because of her career, or at least that was her perfect excuse. The more distressing question was, what made me believe I would ever make her stay? From the very start, being a woman, being with a woman did not sit easily with her. She too always sat uncomfortably in a bowl. And in the end, she didn't cling to my fingers nearly as long as I would have liked. And I was the one ended up smeared in war paint. I anticipated the phone ringing as I dozed on the couch, giving into the sudden nap attack, which was brought on by the exhausting prospect of heading out to the store to score that bag of electric orange carbs. After six long weeks without Lauren and my sister's impending phone call, I hoped that when the phone rang, I would be able to stifle the agonizing hope that it was Lauren calling to tell me she was coming back. Maybe this would be the time I could hide my disappointment when I heard my sister's voice or any voice besides Lauren's. When my sister wouldn't tease me, see, still waiting for the actress, huh? I considered letting my answering machine take my sister's call, but I wouldn't risk the chance that it might be my brother, Vince. His check-in calls were fairly regular and getting more frequent since he was having girl troubles of his own. Vince had been with Erica for almost as long as I had been with the actress, as my sister and Vince's girlfriend, Erica, called her. I was in LA when I first met Erica, the woman who had become my brother's girlfriend, and she had introduced herself as Erica, as in all my children, and that nickname stuck for a while. I liked Erica's cocky attitude and had introduced her to my brother and then congratu congratulated myself at quite regular intervals on putting together the world's first, the world's most perfect straight couple. When I told Vince the unsurprising news that the actress decided she could not be with a woman again, and it was all over again, and she was so sorry again, Vince trumped me with his own news. Erica and Vince, the world's most perfect couple, were also breaking up. So I did what my sister would do when presented with these facts. I blamed my brother for blowing the perfect couple I had created. He was mad at me for about a week, evidence he only called me twice. But by the following week, he'd resumed his natural pattern of calling every other day, eventually realizing 
it wasn't my fault. Since we all knew his track record with women had been spotty at best. Before Erica, my sister and I could blame our brother's failed relationships on his selection of the Bobby doll of the week. This time, it was my reputation on the line. I had made this perfect couple and he had blown it big time. Erica and Vince were no more. My sister had been equally compassionate when I called her to share my news about being dumped. Lisa had said back then, there's something about straight girls you just can't put your finger on. And then she laughed and snorted for several minutes at her own joke. I snapped back to reality when the phone rang and I opt to pick it up rather than hear my nauseatingly cheerful voice on the answer machine since I was no longer that person. That person was sporting my pre-dumped voice. Hello, Lisa said, don't get your panties in a twist. It's just me. Don't be an ass, I said. I've stopped thinking she'll call. Liar, she said. Shut it, I said. Lisa said, don't lose your sense of humor. You effed a straight actress. She pulled an Anne Heche on your sorry ass and you got dumped. Now scrape your freaking shoe and move on. I said, don't pretend you didn't like her. Of course I liked Lauren. I like all women, Lisa said. That doesn't mean I don't know how to kick a dog to the curb if they piss on my leg and try to tell me it's raining. So what's going on, I said, already exhausted. Unlike Vince, who always called about nothing, Lisa always called with some sort of news. Are you sitting down, she asked. I'm laying down, I said, already exhausted. I braced myself because you never knew with Lisa. This could be the call our family all expected, the call from a prison in Maine for running an Italian restaurant out of her home with no permits to sell food or the gallons of homemade wine she calls V. She told mom and dad V stood for vino. And then she forgot and told them it was named after Vince. But the triangle shaped label was an obvious and familiar reference. Dad figured it out. And he would ask for another glass with pure delight. Give me another shot of that J juice. And then when he got away with that in front of mom, dad switched it up to sure am craving some more of a JJ. Lisa said, you might want to sit up for this. I've got news. I've decided what I'm going to do with my share of grandma's inheritance. I said, you mean the money you said you didn't want because it would only bring pretentious and empty lives to all who touched it? You and Vince haven't spared my share, right? She asked. Nope, I said. Dad helped me set it up for you in a money market. He said you'd want it eventually. He's known you a bit longer than I have. Lisa is two years older than me. His actual words were, quote, even an earthy, crunchy bull dyke from Maine can find use for a few million dollars. Not from Maine anymore, Lisa said. Are you ready? You want to guess? I didn't want to guess. I've decided to buy a campground in Rhode Island, and you're going to help me run it. She sang out this news with that typical ta-da sound in her voice, waiting for applause. No, I said. Spoiler alert, that's not what happens in the book. Oh, thanks, Mary. That was very entertaining. What a great way to start a Sunday afternoon thanks. with a lot of laughter. Appreciate it. Now, I, we, now we have to all go read the rest of the book and find out what else <laughs> to the camp town. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And just a reminder for those of you who have joined us a little late, if you could just please put your, um, what am I going to say? Put your uh, questions in the chat. If you have any questions in the chat, that would be terrific. Okay, our next reader is Linda Skibsky. And I do a little spotlight here. Linda is uh, the author of Forever Joanne. And she's a retired specialist for the blind and visually impaired. And she's taught in Michigan and in Rhode Island for some 37 years. She was born in Springfield, Mass. And while Forever Joanne is her first book, writing has always been a persistent avocation that now demands her time. She lives in Providence with two kitties who have trained her well. And I'm also aware that she is an avid pickleball player even when it snows. So welcome, Linda. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mev. And again, also, my thanks to you for all the hard work that you've done 
for um, compiling all the uh, history that we need to gather in Rhode Island. Um, and I enjoyed, Mary, your reading very much. <laughs> it was excellent. Thanks, Linda. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, my book, Forever Joanne, if I can get it in the right Zoom. There we go. This is tricky. OK. Um, is a memoir. It's the first book that I've written, but um, many others have egged me on to do something else. So who knows what will come next? Um, this is a memoir about my wife, Joanne. We were together 21 years. Um, sadly, she died from ovarian cancer about four years ago. And uh, soon after her diagnosis, uh, she expected me to write a book. And I thought she was crazy, but um, she persisted. And every time I took a picture, she would say, oh, that can be for your book. Um, so it was about a year after she died that I buckled down and uh, started writing. Um, our roller coaster journey was similar to many others, I think, for people who have had cancer. But um, I think uh, we handled it with as much honesty and humor and love and faith that we could muster. And uh, mm -hmm. I think perhaps the reading that I've chosen will give you kind of a little bit of uh, uh, an idea of the ups and downs anyway. So here we go. Back in the recliner at the infusion center for the all day round of treatment, Joanne had already received the steroids, Benadryl and anti-nausea drugs while I sat in my usual chair beside her. The familiar warm blankets covered her from neck to toe while the hood of her sweatshirt that was draped over her head completed the outfit. Mm -hmm. The nurse was magically separating the entangled IV tubes as she prepared the first bag of strong chemo. Which one is that? Joanne asked the nurse. Since she had brought special ice pack sacks for her hands and feet, she anticipated pulling them out for the Yondellus. This is the Doxel, she replied. The Yondellus will be the last one. The color of the bag she was hanging was a brilliant red. I have to say that looks like a hummingbird feeder, I chuckled as I looked at the red liquid. They both laughed at the comic relief. I wish it was just sugar water, Joanne said with emphasis, or even a cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitans were one of her favorite drinks, but she'd have to forego them during the treatment. That's even better, I agreed. I hated the thought of what that poison was doing to her body as we remembered happier times. Years before, when our relationship was new and we still felt like hormone-driven teenagers, a memorable night in P-Town haunted us for years. At the end of the summer, we were at yet another bed and breakfast for the weekend when we decided to watch the moon over the water. Since Joanne had had one too many cosmopolitans, mm -hmm. I drove her dark purple Honda to the beach where we could sit in the car watching the waves. I don't think we're supposed to be here after sunset, I said cautiously as we drove through the open gate. I had noticed the sign at the entrance. Oh, they won't check, Joanne replied with bravado. With or without a few drinks, I knew very well that she enjoyed breaking some rules. Since there were other cars in the parking lot also stretching the rules, I relaxed somewhat as I pulled into a space further down for everyone's privacy. As the sky darkened, early stars dotted the velvet backdrop and the crescent moon glowed over the ocean swells 
as if the show at the drive-in was about to begin. For a few minutes, we silently watched the peaceful scene unfold as we held hands in the car. This is so beautiful, I said softly. I turned and smiled at Joanne's loving face. With only the sound of the surf, we kissed each other lightly at first. As time seemed to stand still, our passion grew and we melted together. We hadn't noticed that the other cars had left the parking lot. Let's get in the back seat, she whispered. As we clumsily moved arms and legs over the console to reach the back, our giggles interrupted the mood. The thought crossed my mind that it hadn't been that long ago when Joanne had been reluctant to even hold hands on the streets of P-Town. She had definitely dropped her guard. By this time, clothes were unbuttoned and zippers unzipped in the back seat when we heard a vehicle nearby come to a stop. We froze in place with hearts pounding in fear as well as passion. As a light flashed through the driver's window, we clamored to redress as quickly as humanly possible, considering the tight space. Through the glass, we heard a man's voice. What's going on here? The voice called out with authority. He waited while we returned to the front seats. I need to see your driver's license and registration. Then he added, you know, the beach is closed for the night. After opening the window, I mumbled something about being sorry and handed the documents to the uniformed officer. Despite our own embarrassment, he made no comment about our escapade in the back seat. While he looked at the papers, I turned to Joanne, who was attempting to stifle a smirk and possible laugh. Well, I won't find you this time, but consider this warning. The officer kept a serious face. And just to let you know, your name will be in the computer, so be careful. He handed the documents back to me as I said my automatic thank you. <laughs> Naturally, he waited in his patrol car while we backed out and headed to the gate. I'm not sure if he could tell we were holding in our laughter, but we let it out as soon as he passed and drove away. Oh, geez, I managed to say between laughs. I knew we shouldn't have parked there, I added half-heartedly. Breaking the rules with Joanne was always an adventure that I seemed to enjoy as well. Can you believe that? Joanne exclaimed with tears in her eyes from laughing so hard. Now your name's in the computer. She laughed even harder. Well, it's your car, I reminded her. Suddenly her laughter sub subsided. Oh yeah, we were both outlaws. You'll have to read the rest. <laughs> That's terrific, Linda. Thank you very much. It reminds me of the time when teachers would always say, it'll be on your permanent record. <laughs> That's all I can think of. It's really perfect. I know. Uh, and where was this beach? Was that in Provincetown? Herring it was Herring Cove Beach? beach. Yes, in P-Town. Oh. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I used to watch the sunset, that's for sure. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a great sunset. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Our next reader is Elda Dauber, whose book that she's going to read from today is Wait Until I'm Dead. And now I have to find Elda again so that I can spotlight her. There she is. Um, Elda is nationally known and an award-winning clinical social worker whose 40 plus years in her professional career has been dedicated to working with children and adults victimized by childhood sexual abuse. She has treated families, contributed articles, and educated fellow professionals on topics related to many interpersonal violence situations. 
She's been active in the LGBTQ community in Rhode Island for many years. Um, she's also currently active in Olak, Rhode Island. She lives in South County with her wife and extended family. Welcome, Elda. Thank you, Mev, and thanks for doing this. And, um, and my appreciation for the other two authors' work, I have to read both of them. So on my way uh, to the bookstore or online as soon as we're done here. So um, it's always great to meet and to work with other authors. So my book is, my first book that I ever wrote was called Wait Until I'm Dead. And it's the um, culmination of, I don't know if you can see a little eyeball there. That's my grandson. We put him in a closet and took his picture. And uh, the, my first book ever was the winner of the um, uh, book of the year with the independent publishers of New England. Um, it's a novel based on everything Mev just read about me. I, when I retired from um, social, full-time work, social work, I uh, was left with the voices of a lot of children that I worked with. And um, I wanted very much to be able to find a vehicle to educate people about um, abuse in, that, in a way that would make them read it. So I have a, a novel of intrigue that has a novel, has a manuscript within it, which is the manuscript of the, of the main character of the book. So there's a book within a book. But what I want to do with you now is to read you the first chapter of Wait Until I'm Dead, and then uh, two uh, brief readings from the manuscript within it. Okay, I hope that's understandable. If it isn't, ask me questions later, but uh, let me just begin, okay? Because each of these is, is uh, brief. Uh, and in this one, the, um, the uh, author has brought her manuscript to her uh, editor. The manuscript lies dead center between them, arranged like an object dark on the massively imposing rich ebony desk. Curled edges of the first 30 pages testament to the fact that someone has at least read to chapter three, perhaps more than once from the looks of things. DJ Brava, famed author of the romance genre, sits on the wrong side of the desk, shoulders slightly hunched, left leg over the right, the movement of that leg gaining momentum by the second. Words from somewhere back in time pushed to the forefront of her consciousness. Hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. What on earth is this supposed to be? DJ looks up to see the long and elegantly manufactured, uh, manicured pointer finger poking furiously at her title page. You, and now the finger is directed at her, are a romance writer. The entire reading world awaits the sixth book in your latest series. And you send me this? The question is accompanied by the zipper-like sound of the pages being flipped in anger. He levels what he hopes passes for an authoritarian glare at her. I got it, I read it, it's not romance, that's for damn sure. What am I supposed to do with this? Publish it. It's good, it'll sell. With my name on it, it will sell big. Donna Jean Bravo, queen of lust and thrust, allows her shoulders to relax and leans forward, both hands on the highly polished desk surface purposely leaving her mark. Cold, she says, throaty voice competing with the sound of his deep leather chair scooting back from her closeness. This is the one. This is the book I have needed to write from the beginning. It is what I have needed to say for my entire life, but I have never had the words of wisdom until now, right now. But the series is progressing nicely and the readers want, the series has to wait. No sixth or seventh book about Serpentine's misadventures in the land of the love long can claw its way into my head and out of me right now. But this one, she indicates the manuscript Cole has pulled closer to his side of the desk. This one is next. After that, I'll give you as many sequels or new series as you want. You're my editor, you can make it happen. She sits back once again, taking satisfied note of the 10 pronounced smudges she has left upon his almighty desk and waits. Regaining his imperiousness, Cole Alexander thinks of reaching into his pocket for a monogrammed handkerchief to wipe the prints from his desk. Containing himself for the moment, he says, this is not what we pay you for, DJ. We're a big company and you're the big part of it, yes, but you don't control who gets what gets published here. 
Here or somewhere else, Cole, it's your call. Here or somewhere else. DJ reaches into the seat of the ch uh, chair for her canvas case. I'll need to know by next week. You can reach me on my cell. I have some traveling to do and a few people to see before news of this book gets out. She rises and leaves the room with an ever so slight last second tug at the door meant to convey her determination. Cole sits quietly for a few minutes, fingers tented and resting against his chin. He reaches for the manuscript and twice flips the stack of pages between his thumb and forefinger, listening to the sound of money. He knows how good, a good book when he sees it, and this is a very good one. He knows it'll sell and sell big, but at what price and to whom? Picking up the phone, he deliberately touches the same number three times. Cole hears the phone being answered. We have trouble, he says, and hangs up. Okay, what I'd like to read next, if that's okay with everybody, is the um, first chapter of the manuscript of the book that DJ has written called Peeling the Onion. I have a memory of myself as a young adult in the first house I owned, standing beside my pre-clicker, pre-color, pre-cable TV, channel surfing all three stations. Settling in on, Don, on the Phil Donahue show, I adjusted the volume and sank into my grandmother's ancient couch, sank being the operative word here, for this solitary piece of living room furniture whose three worn cushions, now concave, had sheltered the behinds of many a relative. Phil was doing his usual routine of flitting through the audience, microphone in hand, looking for all the world like an albino hummingbird, seeking delicious nectar from the numerous fertile plants offering themselves to him. The topic of the day was child sexual abuse, the numbers of victims astonishing, the need for intervention urgent. The guest authority of the day quoted statistics that were in fact quite frightening. Hands shot up throughout the audience. Phil darted down one aisle and halfway up another, microphone at the ready. Stretching across three people, he hovered in front of a woman who asked, so how do we keep these children safe? What do we tell them to do? All eyes shifted to the expert. He paused for a moment, turned his palms up as if pleading with the universe for wisdom and said in an almost whisper, tell them not to go home. Oxygen sucked out of the room with one great gas, then silence. No one dared breathe. Even Phil was stricken. He perched heavily on the armrest of the nearest seat, raised the microphone to his lips and then lowered it again. A suddenly flightless albino hummingbird. Tell them not to go home, I repeated to no one in my living room. If only it were that simple. Well, for another minute, I'd like to read um, the very last piece from her manuscript. When I was very little, we lived in my grandmother's house with Lena, my parents, and my brother. At my grandmother's house, I held JJ's hand and danced in the sunlight backyard, played hide and seek beneath the rows of sheets and towels on the clothesline. I picked buttercups and held them under my chin, watched lumpy green caterpillars climb among, along tomato plants. Banana curls circled my smiling face, gleamed in the sunshine and fell across the shoulders of the sweater knit by hand, especially for me. I napped on the glider on the screened-in porch, robin songs filling my sleep, and I woke to the sweet scent of the evening's pasta sauce as it bubbled its way to perfection in the kitchen. We moved when I was four, moved away from the joys and safety of this life I was living, surrounded by love, secure in myself and confident of my place in the world, and landed directly in a full decade of hell. What would my childhood have been like, I used to wonder, had I been fortunate enough to have danced in my grandmother's backyard for 10 more years, who would I be today? What would my life be like today, I often wonder, had I lacked the courage to, sh to choose healing? Who would I be today? I spend my life writing romance novels, works of fiction that have very little to do with the truth of my daily life. I love my work and the pleasure it brings to those who read it, but it does not speak to all of who I am. This book is the truth of my life. I offer it with hope for the future of every child, that they will be born into a world where they are free to dance in the sun, a world that has found its way to peace and has learned to prioritize protecting our most vulnerable from all forms of abuse. I ask you to imagine a world in which every child is loved and held safe, a world in which home is the safest place a child can go. 
that's it. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Elda. That was really quite moving. Um, Thank you. Your home can be the safest place of all. This is really not true for so many. Thank you for writing that. Um, okay, and now we will finally hear from, who are we gonna hear from? Susan Joyce and Thea Ernest. I'm gonna spotlight them so that we can see them. And Susan, I don't know very well. She is uh, new to me. Um, so welcome, Susan. I'm glad to finally meet you. Uh, she is the author of Billy the Rescue Dog. And it's the true story of Billy, a tree walker, a tree walker coonhound. That's hard to say. Tree walker coonhound. And uh, this is a true story. And so we'll learn more about the antics of Maggie's Farm in Rhode Island and Paws, New England. And also welcome to Thea Ernest, who is the illustrator of Billy the Rescue Dog. And she is, a, she, Thea's been a friend of mine for many years. She has a degree in metal smithing from Rhode Island School of Design. She's created many different art creations, including functional decorative cabinet hardware, reproduction lighting fixtures, um, bold object sculpture and whimsical wire, wire structures, which if you could see my window over here, a couple of them hanging in my window here. But she's recently found Urban Sketchers Workshop and now makes a painting a day part of her normal routine. And she has craved the practice and she enjoys quieter way of telling stories to her viewers through pen and watercolor sketches. So welcome, Susan and Thea. Thank you. I'm going to um, start off and then hand over to Thea. Um, the, and the, Billy the Rescue Dog is a children's picture book, so it's short, so I'll be able to read the whole, <laughs> the whole thing uh, to everyone. Um, at the end of November 2019, which is pre-pandemic, a little hard to imagine um, there was a pre-pandemic, my wife, uh, Sharice, and I decided that our older dog, Oliver, um, who was uh, 11 at the time, um, might like to have another dog around. We, we were hoping that it would keep him more engaged and stimulated. I searched online and found a dog um, who had been rescued by Paws New England, which is a, a wonderful rescue organization. And this dog had been chained to a dog house his entire life, and he was literally skin and bone. His, all his ribs stood out, his hip bones stood out. Paws New England puts dogs into foster homes, so they get them away from whatever situation they're in, and they put them in foster homes, so the foster family can get to know the dog more and um, be better able to match it with um, what will hopefully be the dog's forever home. So they, they know the dog's um, personality and needs. Um, Sharice Olive and I, Oliver and I went up to meet uh, the dog who we were would eventually call Billy um, and Billy's foster mother in a park um, so the dogs could see if they would get along and they did, so we adopted Billy. The first few months of Billy's life, um, he, he, I'm sorry, not his life, but his life with us, he didn't put on any weight and we were really getting worried that he might never fill out. And um, he also slept in a tight little ball uh, on, on his bed um, and he didn't move when he slept. Then gradually his ribs started to disappear from, from view um, and we realized that he was starting to stretch out in his dog bed. Um, getting more and more relaxed. And then he started to twitch when he dreamt, um, which dogs do, but it hadn't occurred to us that Billy had never done that before. So we, mm -hmm. we felt that Billy was starting to, to dream, hopefully happy dreams. Um, and we, we realized that Billy had decided that he was home finally, that this was where he was gonna live. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to write a children's book about Billy but I couldn't figure out how to start it. And then I remembered that day that we met the foster, Billy and his foster mother in the park, there was a little boy there with his mother and he asked if he could meet the dog. So we introduced him and we introduced Billy as a rescue dog. And the boy immediately started to ask what kinds of rescues Billy had made. 
and we realized that um, as mother took a few minutes, a few seconds too, to try to figure out what he was talking about, we realized uh, the boy thought that Billy was a dog that rescued people. And so we said, no, he's a rescued dog, that Billy had been rescued. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I remembered that little boy, I knew how the story should begin. And I'm gonna share my screen um, because the part of, they're my words, but, but Thea has, um, Thea's illustrations are so beautiful and they help tell the story. And then I'll, I'll read the story and turn it over to Thea. Oops, nope, not that one. All right, here we go. Billy the Rescue Dog. We're not seeing a picture yet though, Susan. You're... Is this my, okay. I think you should stop sharing and then start all over again. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. There, we, there we go. All right. All right, Billy the Rescue Dog. <laughs> Billy is a rescue dog. Um, are you seeing all of you or can you see the story? We're seeing the story now. Okay. Yeah. Billy is a rescue dog, not a dog that rescues someone lost in the woods or in the snowy mountains. Maybe it's more accurate to say that Billy is a rescued dog. Billy spent the first year of his life chained to a dog house. When some kind people found him, he was sick and very, very thin. They promised to make him better, and they did. Once he was healthy, these good people promised to find him a family to love him, and they did. At first, Billy was overwhelmed. Everything was new. He had never met cats. He had never seen goats or chickens. Billy had never lived indoors. He needed time to get used to everything. His parents gave him a bed all his own. Billy ate breakfast and dinner and lots of treats to help him get strong. He took walks with his family. When the weather grew colder, Billy wore a new coat to keep warm. Billy could curl up by the wood stove to nap with the cats and lean in for a snuggle just to know he was safe. As Billy settled into his new life, something happened. He started to find things. He found a frog, he found a bunny. Most exciting of all, he found a tennis ball. One day a fox tried to grab one of the chickens for its dinner. The chicken escaped, but Billy's parents couldn't find her. They searched everywhere. Up beneath the lilac, around the shed, in the wood pile, behind the hen house, up in the apple trees, inside the goat barn, under the hoof cumber vines, no chicken. It was starting to get dark and they were getting very worried. Finally, they turned to Billy and asked, can you find the chicken? Billy went straight to a bush and pointed. And there she was. The chicken had found a safe hiding place. Billy, you found the chicken. It turns out Billy is a rescue dog. <laughs> Yay. And that's the story. <laughs> um, so, so Thea, um, I'm going to turn over to Thea to talk about her gorgeous paintings and how she uh, helped tell the story. Susan, thank you. I love seeing that book over and over again. It's just um, the Illustrating this book was the best part of the pandemic for me because we started um, on the phone with Susan, who I already knew but didn't know, you know, hadn't worked with in this way before. And with our um, designer, Jeanette, who was in New York City. So we were on the phone every week on Zooms trying to put this together. I had met Billy and the other animals and the, and the humans on the farm. But when I met them, originally, I did not think about drawing a book. 
So a lot of the development of the characters was through lots of photos from Susan and lots of stories as I went along about, you know, I would draw something and then she'd say, I don't, Billy wouldn't do that. So, you know, lots of back and forth and working as a team to get the story to work. Um, Susan had some pretty clear images for the story as it was already developed. And, uh, but what happened was that I would draw something that would surprise her. She would say something back that would surprise me. And we kind of kept developing it as we went along. And the designer in New York, Jeanette would say, hey, how about if this page was flipped? It would flow better from one page to the next. You know, so there were many things that we brought from each of us from our expertise that we um, that really enhanced the process of working as a team. Um, none of us had made a book before, even though we had all brought some experiences that worked well together. But it was, you know, kind of stumbling along and finding out details and, you know, upping our game and then keeping going. Um, so it was from. August or September, Susan, when we started? I think August. And then the following uh, summer is when the book actually went out into people's hands. So just a, a long process of working um, through a really isolated time otherwise. Uh, so this was a really key thing to do. Um, some of the challenges were making sure that the characters were consistent from page to page. So there was no question about who you were looking at. Um, I made caricatures of Susan and Charisse, you know, which is hard when you know people and you're not really caricaturist, but I decided things like, okay, Charisse is always gonna wear Timberland boots and Susan will always be in muck boots. So even when you don't see their heads in some of the pictures, when they're walking with the animals, you still know who's who. They have, you know, they're wearing their same color clothing or something like that. Um, I picked one of their chickens to be the star of the show where the, you know, the fox is coming after it. And I, we had a, quite a discussion about how scary should the book be? Because there's a joy in little kids to have some scary part to the story. They seem to really be intrigued by that. Um, but when we saw Billy chained to the, to the uh, doghouse, like, well, how do we want it to be like those TV commercials that wrench your heart when you see them? And we're like, no, 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 not that far. Okay, do we want the, in the fox picture, do we want blood? Do we want it to actually catch the chicken? No, 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 let's just suggest that it's catching the chicken or trying to catch the chicken. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of development that was, something I hadn't had to do for any other project. Um, and a lot of, uh, you know, time negotiating back and forth until really the three of us were all satisfied with the way the story moved, how it looked on the page, the details of the book itself, including, I mean, even arguments, not arguments, but lots of discussion about the spine of the book. Because in a bookstore, the spine is what you may see first. So, and which never occurred to me, like we're spending so much time on this tiny strip on the back of the book, but sometimes that's what you're gonna see first. So um, the whole process was just tremendous. And uh, Susan came very, you know, clear and prepared with her story and clear and prepared about what each of our roles were, which made the process so much better. I've talked to many people who have an idea for a book and they have no idea how to produce a book or what's involved in the work involved. And I know the other authors have understood what I'm saying because I'm sure you have all had these conversations now that you've written a book too, where someone says, oh, I have this best idea. I've been thinking of this for years. And you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, let's see it. Let's see the work. Um, Cause it takes a lot to actually make it happen. So uh, it's, it's amazing. Every time I go out and talk to people about it or we go to a school and read it to children or go to the flea market and see people coming over with curiosity, it's really 
has been great to see it in, you know, having come to full circle. Well, and, and Thea, I didn't, um, I, I haven't actually talked to you since then, but I, I was at a, Thea and I have gone to schools together, but I was at my, in Foster, the elementary school this past Thursday. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, we've just encountered wonderful questions from kids. So mm -hmm. one little girl asked me uh, why people would be so mean to a dog. Oh. And uh, so I had a moment where, and I was trying to think how to answer, and I, I hope I answered it as uh, um, sufficiently, but I, I said to her that some people didn't care for animals, um, but luckily there were um, people and places like Paws New England that did care and did try to help. Because mm. um, I went, she was, I think, a third grader, so I didn't want um, it's important for her to know, but I, I didn't want it to be hopeless, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great answer. I think wonderful answer. And when we were at the Gordon School, uh, we spoke to two different groups of kids, different ages. And one of the third or fourth graders, um, after I talked about the creative process and drawing, I mentioned that there are times when I finish a drawing and I just don't like it. And sometimes I'll throw a drawing out and start over again. And uh, the one of the students said to me, have you ever thrown something out and then regretted it later? And <laughs> it helped me realize too, okay, don't throw it out now. Maybe you're just hungry or tired and you don't like your work, but maybe in the morning, you're gonna be happy that you have that drawing done. So, you know, they, they just had fascinating questions, all the kids, it's been great. I'm a little disappointed that Billy hasn't walked in behind Susan and, <laughs> and howled, howled. You should hear what he, you know, his voice when he's got something to say. It's pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to meet Billy at some point. Thank you, Thea and Susan. That was really wonderful. And um, I want to say also, as you were telling the story, it occurred to me that it sounds like Billy rescued the both of you during the time of pandemic to kind of keep you busy and keep your artistic juices flowing and all of those kinds of things. So that's absolutely you. true. 